Well, good morning again. Uh, our scripture this morning, um, you know, sometimes when you're preparing, you pray and it's just a, it's a wrestling match all week long. And then there's other messages and topics or just a direction that just seems to be right there. Uh, this is one of those where um, it was just right there. So we're going to read this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 6 through 15. So if you have your Bibles, take them out or turn them on or however you're following along in Scripture. But Matthew 6, chapter 6, verse 6 is where we're going to begin. <clears throat> Jesus speaking said, And when you pray, do not pray like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Bow with me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the gift of your word your self-revelation to us about who you are and what you've done for us, the great gift of grace and salvation, but also the many lessons it has to teach us about who you have created us to be. We pray now that you would open our eyes and our ears, you would write your word upon our hearts, help us to understand how to apply it in our lives and carry it with us throughout this week, that we will be a better reflection of you your light, and your love. Let the words that I speak here today not be mine. I ask always that they would be yours. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, uh, again, I told you before about picking titles for messages. It's always an interesting thing, but titled this one, The Do's and Don'ts of Prayer. Uh, you could have just called it prayer. You could have called it the Lord's Prayer. Um, but basically, I think it's, it's very helpful for us to understand what Jesus was saying to us here in this gospel. First of all, remember, this is the gospel of Matthew. And uh, Matthew wrote his gospel predominantly to a, a Jewish audience. Okay, So his thrust in writing the gospel was really to try and help prove the messiahship to the chosen people so that they would understand who Jesus really was. And um, this particular passage that we read, can, it really comes in the middle of the greatest sermon ever given, okay, the Sermon on the Mount. And this is really, this kind of splits the uprights. It's right chapter six because it's from five to seven. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and I would encourage you to read this this weekend. It's really, there's so much in there. Uh, there's no way 
to really even to do just the Lord's Prayer justice in one message. It really could simply, each verse of that prayer could be an entire sermon series, believe me. But understand that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is trying to help the people understand what is really necessary. Because remember, the Jews especially were being taught by the Pharisees, and the Pharisees had put all of these rules in place about how they had to live their life. And, you know, on the Sabbath, they couldn't do anything. They were lucky they could breathe on the Sabbath and not be, you know, penalized for that. Uh, but, the, you know, Jesus, if you read, especially in chapter 5, you will hear him say many times to the people, you have heard it said, dot, 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 but I tell you, Okay, in other words, this is what the Pharisees have been teaching you. But I am telling you, this is the way it should be. And oftentimes, if you look at the contrast between the two things that Christ brought up, oftentimes you would look at what Jesus said and go, that's impossible. There's no way any of us could ever, could ever do that. And that's really the point. That's the point Jesus is trying to drive home. You can't do it yourself. I have to do it for you. And all you need to do is turn to me. That's the whole point. If you really want to sum up the Sermon on the Mount, just turn to Jesus and you're going to understand the whole thing much, much better. So remember, he says, you've heard it said, but I tell you. And in the midst of that, we get to this part here about the Sermon on the Mount and then the Lord's Prayer, as we like to call it. Well, you know, I think about prayer today. Uh, what does that mean for many people? Here's probably one of the most common things I have heard, and I have said it in the past, and when I finally realized it, I stopped saying it. Uh, and now it just kind of sets my teeth on edge or raises the hair on the back of my neck, whatever you want to say. But when people say, when there's a bad situation going on or has happened, well, I guess all we can do now is pray. Listen to what that says. Do you understand that? All we can do is pray? I, I just, that boggles my mind that I said that many times in the past when I was younger as well, and now I think I have a much greater and better understanding of the power of prayer. Uh, if you think about it, you know, the fact that we are even given the privilege, the fact that Jesus, God himself, told us to pray to him, okay? This was an instruction for us to do, not just a, 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 you know, a helpful suggestion. You know, he wants to hear from us. You know, that, what a blessing that the almighty creator of everything we can see wants to hear from us individually. Yes, corporately as worship, but he wants to know you. He wants your heart, and he wants you to come to him. So we have the great privilege of entering what in the Old Testament would have been called the Holy of Holies. In the tabernacle and in the temple, there was a section called the Holy of Holies, and there was only one person who could go into that once a year, and that was the high priest. It was to go in to make atonement for sins for the people. When he went in there, they would literally tie a rope around him so that when he went in, if he didn't come out, they could literally pull him out so that no one would go in and be put to death. I mean, remember that uh, when David brought the ark into, uh, he was bringing it into Jerusalem, and it, the ox stumbled, and Uzzah reached out. And I, I always read that, and it just used to trouble me so much. I'm like, geez, God, he was just trying to help. He had struck him down, you know. But when you think about that, it's, you know, God says, hey, I have rules. And they are to be obeyed, and they will be obeyed. I mean, how many of us as parents have ever uttered those words? You will do what I told you, or there will be repercussions, right? <laughs> if any of you guys are like me as a little boy, you always like to test to see, well, did they really mean it? Uh, yeah, they meant it, trust me. Um, but, you know, listen to this from the Old Testament, talking about the Holy of Holies, okay? I just love this section of Scripture from the from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. 
and he writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. How much would that change our prayer life if this is the vision that we think of before we approach God. If we think this is who we are coming before to offer our prayers, would they be as flippant? Would it be that we would just write one off quick and take off? This is an opportunity for you and I to be in direct communication with the almighty creator. He wants to hear from you and I. So how do we know it's okay to enter the Holy of Holies? Well, listen to this from Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 52. Matthew 27, starting verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The, bod the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. So when Jesus died, the veil, or the curtain as it's called, that separated the Holy of Holies from the people was torn. Now that veil, I don't know if you know this, but the way it was woven was nearly four inches thick. Four inches thick in material. And notice what it says. There's a very, very important thing that's said here. It's torn from top to bottom, not from bottom up. God tore the veil open, not man. When Jesus died, that veil was torn. God said, that's it. I am opening forever the ability for everyone to come to me at any time. What a privilege we have that the Almighty Father came and gave his own life for you and I and gives us that permission to enter his presence, and now he even instructs us to do it in the Lord's Prayer. So take a look at what we read, and look at what is being said here. First of all, I want you to understand that when Jesus told the disciples and the people about this, I do not believe he was giving them a prayer that he meant for them to constantly recite. I don't think it's bad to say the Lord's Prayer. I love to say the Lord's Prayer. You know, I grew up in the Catholic Church. Believe me, I've said the Lord's Prayer an awful lot, okay? But it's a beautiful prayer, but it's a template for prayer. It's to instruct us, and what did he say? When you pray, this is how you should pray. So think about the stanzas of this. Our Father, first and foremost, God made it personal. He said, just come to me like I'm your dad. Talk to me. I'm here to listen. Give me a chance. I think you might be surprised at what I can do. So acknowledge who God is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So praise and worship. Acknowledging who God is, praise and worship first. You know, you probably think, oh, well, you know, as a pastor, you always do all this stuff. Oh my goodness, if you only knew how long it took me before God finally hit me with the two by four to go, hey, you should pray for other people before you pray for yourself. You know, so what does it say? Start with praise and worship. Is that the way we always pray? I know it's not for me, I'm working at it, but I have to remind myself, you know what, it really is right to stop and say, thanks God, 
Thanks for everything you've done for me. You're, you are the almighty creator. And just let words come to you from scripture. If you're not sure, open the Psalms. Pray a Psalm. That's a great thing to do sometimes. Just pray the words. And sometimes, you know, there's a, uh, a way of praying that you can take, take a verse and you, what you do is you take each word and you emphasize it one time through. So you start the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. And next time it'll be our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. You emphasize each word until you've gone through the whole verse or couple of verses and you will find that that verse is going to impact you in a mighty different way when you do it. It's a very powerful way to pray. And then begin your intercession. Pray for people. Pray for others first. And I think you will find that your prayer life takes on, it morphs into a whole new experience and you find that you actually have a call to do that. So praise and worship, you know, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not thy kingdom come, my will be done. Okay? It's not about us. Anybody read the Purpose Driven Life here? What's the first sentence in the book? It's not about you. I've always loved that he started the book that way. It's so cool because it's the truth. It's not about us. And yet when we pray, it's the first thing we think of. I, 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 me, me, me. You know, I don't know if anybody, you ever saw the, the, the Disney movie Nemo, you know, Finding Nemo. It's one of my favorite when the birds fly into the thing and all you hear the beaks saying, mine, 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 mine. Well, that's, you know, don't we go to God in prayer like that oftentimes? But that's not what he's asking. He's not saying he doesn't want to hear from us, but he wants us to intercede for other people, okay? So it's not about us. We need dependence on him, okay? Give us this day our daily bread. If you read in the book of Numbers, when the people were wandering in the desert and they were hungry and they cried out to Moses, you know, why did you take us out of Egypt? We had everything we could ever have wanted. Now we're out here, we have nothing. So God provides manna. But he does have another rule. He says, okay, only gather enough for you and your family for one day. If you don't, it's going to spoil. You know, now that at first sounds like, well, gee whiz, why would he do that? Give us this day our daily bread. Only take enough for one day because God wants the people to understand they need daily dependence on him every single day. If we take it on our own, we, we're always trying to take control. We're going to make sure we've got enough. Thanks, God. I appreciate you got it this far. I'll take the ball and run with it. Okay? God says, no. Trust me. Every day, come to me. Give us this day our daily bread. Start your morning. Before your feet even hit the ground, before you get out of bed, ask God to guide your day. I think you will be very surprised at how different your day progresses from that point on. Praying for forgiveness in humility. You know, forgive us our debts. I love the way Jesus puts this as we have forgiven. He already says, come to me after you have forgiven others. How often do we go to God harboring ill will toward other people? God says, no, no, no. That is not the way it is supposed to be. You need to let go. Let go. How many times have we said as Christians, let go and let God? You know, it's a great phrase. It, it rolls right off our tongue. But do we do it? Do we walk the talk? Okay. This is what God is calling for us to do. Just trust me, he says. Let go of it. I'll take care. Okay? Trust in me. And lead us not into temptation. So we call out for guidance and protection and provision. Protect us from the evil one. Okay? Satan is real. Okay? I don't care what society says today. The enemy is real. And like Peter said, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for those to devour Okay, you need, as Paul taught in Ephesians, to clothe yourself every day in the full armor of God. How do you do that? You pray the armor on. Take that passage and ask God to put each piece on you. 
please God, place the helmet of salvation upon my head. Fit the breastplate of righteousness upon my chest. Buckle the belt of truth around my waist. Fit my feet with the readiness of the gospel of peace. And please place in my hand the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith so that I can stand firm against the fiery darts that the enemy is going to shoot at me. But you know what's interesting about that armor from that day? There's no back plate. You have all this shielding in front, but you have nothing behind you. What's one of the sayings in the military? This is a military town. What do they always say? Watch your six. Where are you most vulnerable? Who is to be your rear guard when you have that armor on? God. God is to be our rear guard. And he promises to do that if we ask him. We don't have to go it alone. And we don't need to go alone. And we shouldn't go alone. When God promises to do all of these things for us, why are we so easily ready to walk away and think that we can do it on our own? He wants to do it for us. So there are some things in the template that I think are important for us to understand about prayer. Uh, there's a lot in there that Jesus said, but let's look at some of the things he told us not to do. Don't be a hypocrite. Do not. So the do nots. Do not be a hypocrite. Why? Because they like to stand on the street corners and let everybody see them and, oh, how wonderful they are. What, a, what an amazing thing that they're doing. Jesus says, no, go in your room, close the door and do it in secret. Quit looking for other people to be the ones who approve what you do. Look for God to approve what you are doing. Go to him in secret, pray to him, and he will reward you when he sees what's done in secret. It's not about you, as Rick Warren said in the book, right? What else? Don't babble. Do not babble. What does he mean by that? It isn't about repetitious words. Okay? It's not that that can be a bad thing, but if you do it all the time, thinking that if you repeat something over and over and over and over again, that's going to have more sway over God's will. Okay? That's not the way it is. God says, don't do that. That's not what I intended. How many of you have ever noticed, I certainly have, especially with all of the meetings I've run in churches, that one of the things people do is, uh, and I was listening to Dr. David Jeremiah this morning, and, and I smiled because he was talking a little bit about prayer, and I'm like, oh, that's a good topic. Um, and he said, you know, people, people put on their prayer voice when it's time. You know, oh, Lord, please come and hear us this morning. Or they... They throw in all the these and the thous and Lord, 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 Lord. You hear Lord 50,000 times or Father, 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 Father. Well, it's not that it's bad to acknowledge God. It isn't as long as it's from the heart. If it's only about show because you know people are listening to you, that's not the way God wants you to go about it. How do I know that? Let's listen to another passage here from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 29, verse 13. Isaiah 29, verse 13. Remember, in, in, uh, I'm ordained in the Reformed tradition, and one of the mantras in the Reformed tradition is, let Scripture interpret Scripture. So that's why when I'm here, you always hear me bringing other verses in, because I think it's important for us, this is how you interpret things, is by looking, what else does God have to say? So Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. That's not, I don't want God thinking about me like that. It's not in their heart. Okay? Such an important element of prayer. This needs to be the seat. The seat of our prayers need to begin here, not here. Okay, We often say in theology, the furthest distance a human ever has to travel is about 16 inches from here to here. Okay, It's really, you can know about Jesus, but until you come to know Jesus, they're two different things. Your prayer needs to come from your heart. 
Don't let your prayers be like you just went to the vending machine, okay? Okay, well, if I put in this much, then God's going to give me this back, okay? That's an easy one to do. How about the accounting principle? All right, well, I've done this many good things this week, God, so uh, I think you owe me at least this one, okay? That isn't the way it works. I I'm sure God laughs oftentimes. Or, or, or coming with an entire laundry list, or, you know, it's a one-way conversation. You want to start before you're going to head out the door to work. Good morning, God. Um, listen, I need this, 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 and this. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Got to go. Going to be late for work. Okay, that's not what he's looking for. All right, that is not prayer. Okay, that is not the right way to go about it. I'm not saying you're not bringing legitimate things, uh, but we need to be careful of that. I've done it. Believe me, I've done it. And then I think about it, and I'm like, you oh, know, that was really rude, first of all. Um, and it really isn't supposed to be a one-way conversation. Um, again, it's not about us. It's about coming before God. And when we pray, not my will be done, your will be done. So in other words, what do you want me to pray about, God? Who are the people that need help today? If we put others before us, okay, kind of like at Christmas, you know, we always see the, weird, the word joy out. Uh, and how many of us as kids learned joy, J-O-Y? Jesus first, others second, yourself last. You know what? You will find true joy if that's your prayer life. Praise God, pray for others, then bring your own personal needs. You do that, I'm going to tell you. When, I, when that finally hit home for me, my prayer life completely changed. Prayer has been a very, very important, integral part of my walk with God my, most of my life. But when I really came to understand that concept, it changed everything for me. Uh, you guys have heard me say this before. I love, I love sports. I grew up in a town where I did that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a runner. I'm athletic. I like doing those things. You know, when I run, I do not bring my phone. I do not bring an iPod or anything else to listen to. Uh, especially when I was at the church. When I was first there, the people thought, I'm running down the street. They're like, hey, Pastor Greg. And they thought I was going to stop and talk to them. I go, mm-mm. Nice to see you. Bye. It's my prayer time. It's my time alone with God. No interruptions. Nobody walking into the office. No phone calls coming in. No music to distract me. Just me out in creation with God. And the more people I have to pray for, the better, because that means I have further to run. Okay? That's the way I look at it. And I love that. I love my time out with God. And that has changed over time. I've really come to enjoy that. And, and, and I'm, hopefully, people are being blessed then through the prayer intercession. That's my prayer. Um, listen to this. What Jesus had to say about... Uh, the Pharisees. So he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law. This is Matthew 28, by the way, 28, 25. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Why would I bring that up? Because it's from the inside. What, what changes? All right. Like Jesus said, it's not what goes into a person. It's what comes out. Why is that important? Because what comes out comes from your heart. Okay? What comes out of your mouth is, is the seat of your emotions. It's really where your, where your thoughts are centered. Are they centered on God? Are they centered on others? Or are they centered on ourself? Jesus warns us in this warning to the Pharisees. You know, oftentimes people read these things and they think, well... Jesus really just didn't like the Pharisees. He wanted to, all he wanted to do was beat them up and put them down. No, he didn't. He was trying to help them see they needed to change. They were going the wrong direction. It wasn't that he doesn't want the Pharisees to be in heaven. He absolutely wants them to be there, or he wouldn't have bothered telling them. He said, look, you're going the wrong way. You need to turn around. It's this way, okay? He went on also in Matthew chapter 15, Verses 11 and 18. So listen to what Jesus said here. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of the mouth, that is what defiles them. 
And then verse 18, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from where? From the heart, and these defile them. So we have to be cautious. We need to be protecting what is in our heart, okay? That is something we do have some control over. We need God's guidance. We need his spirit to change our will to his will. That is a prayer that we must constantly be asking, not my will, but your will. If that's the only prayer you utter throughout a day, you're going to find it be a completely different day. Okay? What's the most important prayer we could ever utter? Forgive me, Lord, a sinner. No more important prayer that any one individual could ever utter than that. What happens if we pray? James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. You do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, what you want. So you quarrel and fight. He goes on to say, you do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. See, again, just reinforcing scripture. If you look at the whole, it teaches us it's not about us. Okay, prayer needs to be intercession. That is a, a gift God gives us, and he will in return bring blessings into our life when we follow that. So it's, it's also not about posture. Uh, you know, again, I grew up Catholic, so uh, you go to a worship service in the Catholic church, you know, you learn very quickly about when to stand, when to sit, when to kneel. Okay, in fact, you can become very robotic about it. I knew exactly when to stand, sit, and kneel uh, after years of doing it. And that's not, any of those things are not bad. Laying prostrate, not bad. Closing your eyes, folding your hands, bowing your head, all excellent forms of prayer. Which one is the right one? Which one is the best one? There isn't a best one. It's from the heart. Where are you? I can do it when I'm out running. I can do it when I kneel at my bed at night before I go to sleep. I can do it at dinner time. We do it at lunch, don't we? When we go, we say grace. Okay. We can do it at the bedside of someone in the hospital who is struggling, someone who may be uh, near being called home to be with the Lord. It doesn't matter where you, you can be out uh, working in your yard. What a great place to do it. That's where God created us from the earth anyway, right? No matter where you are, you can pray any type of prayer that way, okay? Any place at any time. Why? Because Jesus, when he died, the veil was torn. God said, you can come, you can enter any time you want. Okay? Does it have to be a complicated prayer? Do I have to have certain words? Are there key words that cause God's antenna to go, oh, somebody's praying? No. Just from your heart. God, I don't know what's going on today. Uh, I, just, I just feel off. I need your help. Amen. It can be that simple. God, I know that there, there's somebody out there. I don't know who it is. There's somebody that you're, you're laying on my heart. I can't remember who they are. I said I would pray for them. I can't remember who they are, but you know. And you know what they're struggling with. So, Lord, I bring them to you. I lay them at your feet. And I ask that you would intervene for them, whatever it might be, that you will minister to that person right now. I've had, I will tell you, and this is a true story. I, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I, for whatever reason, some people that I knew that had kind of become friends, not close friends, but, you know, acquaintance friends, and they had told me that their mom was sick. And I should, first of all, you have to understand, an atomic bomb could go off before I would wake up in the middle of the night, okay? And I did, and she was just on my mind. I'm like, God, I don't know what's going on, but be with this lady. I got a phone call the next day from them that, that was just about the time that their mom passed away. 
I had no way of knowing that, okay? Uh, I had the great privilege of having that laid on my heart. And thankfully, I actually listened. You know, I would have felt horrible if I had found that out and I thought all I did was roll over and go back to sleep. Sometimes waking up in the middle of the night is not a bad thing. Other times, for many of us, it's a difficult thing, right? You can't go back to sleep. Well, then make it a prayer time. If you're going to be up, make it, make it useful time. That's my encouragement to you on that, all right? But what else about prayer? Here's a key. It's not to be a one-way conversation. What does that mean? God's going to talk to me audibly? I sure wish he would do that. It would sure make things a lot more clear sometimes, right? And that's not a low vision joke, all right? <laughs> But the idea that we need to listen. How often do we do that? It's so easy to pray. And just, as soon as you're finished, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, okay, time to go. But we need to stop and listen. I need to do that. Believe me, I need to work on that more and more every day. But what we do, you know, well, you go, what? but I don't hear anything. It's just silence. You know what? Sometimes that's okay. That's a really good thing. Why? You know what it does even physically to your blood pressure and everything for you to just calm down? There are benefits to this. God gave us the instruction to pray for a reason. Take time to listen. And then, as any eye doctor would tell you, open your eyes. Watch for how God is answering the prayers. Now, if you do all of these things, Will God give you exactly what you prayed about? Sometimes. Sometimes the answer is absolutely. Sometimes the answer is absolutely not. Sometimes it's, yeah, but it's, you're going to have to wait a while. Watch for how God answers prayer. I can tell you, I have never had a prayer that God did not answer. That sounds like an arrogant statement, doesn't it? Oh, what, are you better than the rest of us? Yeah. No. You know how many times he said no to me? He answered. He said, no, that's not the way you're going to go. But it's an answer. And then we have to look at that. If that's the case, if God says no to this, then you got left or right. Which direction does he want you to go? Then you need to ask him, okay, well, if that's not going to be part of it, God, then what do you want me to do? Give me guidance. Show me where do you want me to go. God listens. If your prayer is from your heart, I want you to hear these scriptural promises that I'm going to close with. All right? John chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Jesus says... And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Romans 8, 26 through 27. We often think, what? I don't know what to pray. What should I pray? Paul teaches us, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with with the will of God. In other words, when we pray, the Holy Spirit can take and translate our words into the language that God wants to hear and makes it acceptable to God for us. So just pray what's in your heart and God's Spirit will help take it to the Lord. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, again, Paul teaches us, and pray in the Spirit when on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Be alert. Keep watching. Pay attention. 
What about when things are tough? Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, from 1 John, the fifth chapter, starting verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Let us pray. God of all creation, again, you speak to us through your word. What a blessing that you want to hear from us. We don't deserve it, and yet you love us, and you pour out your love in our lives. Help us to perfect our prayer life to what you would have it be, so that we can be vessels that you use to be a blessing to other people and help build your kingdom. For we ask and pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have music. And this is the time. We have an African song. The title of the song is Siahamba, but we're not going to make you sing it in African. We'll learn that part later. It's a little <laughs> tricky. But it stands for We Are Marching or We Are Walking. You'll catch it really quick because it's repetitive.